are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the XALBI virtual chapter. We are excited you could join us today for Sylvia Duha's session, 10 Great Reasons to Use Excel Tables. This webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the Excel TV and features four back-to-back -back sessions presented by Excel experts and hosts of Excel TV. My name is uh, Johan Bratos. I'm the virtual chapter leader of the Excel BI virtual chapter. And I have a few quick introduction slides before I hand over the reins to Sylvia. She will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll move on to the Q&A session where you can ask any questions that you may have. And next slide, please. If you require technical assistance, please type your question into the question pane located on the right side of your screen, and someone will assist you. The question pane is also where you may ask any questions throughout the presentation. Uh, feel free to enter your question at any time, and once we get to the Q&A portion of the session, I will read your questions aloud to the speaker. You are able to zoom in on the presentation content by using the Zoom button located on the top of the presentation window. Uh, and please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is important to us, so please, please take a moment to complete it. It will appear in your web browser. Uh, also, please note that uh, for some reason, if you raise your hand, uh, in the last session I moderated, I couldn't see the hand raising until at the very end. So it's better to just ask a question, please. Uh, next slide, please. Today's webinar series is brought to you in partnership with Excel TV and the Excel BI virtual chapter. Uh, Excel TV is a live broadcast where Excel and analytics are discussed in a casual format. Join the hosts for topics, tips, and news related to Excel every other Tuesday at excel.tv. The Excel BI virtual chapter features sessions on all things Excel business intelligence related, including advanced predictive and prescriptive analytic topics. Uh, also, join us this Thursday for a Devi night session using Power BI parameters and templates. You can register online at excelbivc. Uh, next slide, please. Silva Juhas is the founder of Excel Consulting, co-host at Excel.tv, and a business slash IT diplomat. As a management consulting, Sylvia aims to disrupt tra traditional Excel thinking by exposing her clients, <coughs> sorry, and their analysts toward better design practices and Excel BI systems included integration methods. Her public and private Excel workshops are widely noted in her current hometown of Los Angeles for their fun, entertaining style. Sylvia is the co-author of Mr. Excel Excel, the 40 greatest Excel tips of all time. Next slide. And you can follow Sylvia on these social media channels. The next slide. Back, I think. Yeah, I think we're I think we're there. Yeah. So without further ado, Sylvia, please take it away. Thank you, Johan. Um, I am very pleased to be here. Thank you again for uh, joining us. This Excel TV Pass BI Virtual Chapter Co-Production: Ten Great Reasons to Use and Love Excel Tables. So let's just get right into it. Uh, there is a follow along file which I believe you can download on the website after this session so if you see any slides throughout the presentation that have this little practice file icon along with a tab name you'll find the corresponding data so you can kind of follow the recording and try it on your own after the session so that is the last of the housekeeping items and we're ready to get right into it so modern Excel table you're going to hear me talk about the modern Excel table and you may be wondering well, haven't we always been using Excel tables? And it's true. We've always worked with tables in Excel, right? Excel is a big giant grid, and that's kind of what we're used to doing. So if you mean table, by, if by tables you mean kind of records of data neatly grouped and organized into rows and columns like you see here, that is kind of a classic Excel range. But then starting with version 2007, those lovely geniuses at Microsoft, they introduced all kinds of new ways of working with tables. Um, and uh, they, the only criticism I have here, hello Microsoft, is uh, the name. It's called table. So it's a little confusing. Um, I will try to 
periodically refer to them as modern Excel tables to um, just to clarify that distinction there. So uh, the main uh, thing to notice about these tables, uh, and we'll get into all of these things throughout the session, lots of great time-saving productivity features uh, in addition to many other things which fall into one of three categories. You'll see these themes repeating throughout the session today. These modern Excel tables, they're all about form in terms of the aesthetics. You can see this lovely alternate row shading, really nicely formatted. Uh, function, they're easier for data modeling purposes. Excel tables just play nice with databases. Uh, and we'll see a couple examples of that shortly. And in terms of the productivity, you just can't beat it. The regular ranges do not have these built-in time savers that uh, are so awesome with these Excel tables that I love. All right, so let's get right into it. How can we create one of these modern Excel tables? Well, there's about three ways. Uh, broadly speaking, there's three ways you can create an Excel table. The first method is probably the best one, if you can uh, get away with it, import from an external database, right? And so uh, you, you may or may not know that we all have on our Excel ribbons, we have this data tab here. And in that data tab over here on the left, you'll notice a get external data button. There's also something called new query, which the next webinar will be getting into more detail. But I want you to notice the myriad of external systems that you can connect to directly from the Excel interface. Right? And so that's probably the ideal way to create an Excel table. Um, and I say that because when you connect to an external system, more often than not, the, the import, the sort of landing uh, format, if you will, uh, the destination format, rather, is going to be an Excel table. So it happens automatically when you can set up this import um, functionality. The second method, uh, let's say you don't have the ability to import from an external system for whatever reason. Uh, in this case, um, as long as you start with a tabular data set, and what I mean by tabular is you've got these neatly organized rows and columns, a header row at the top, each header row, uh, cell in the, that top row is a descriptive title that uniquely identifies the type of data that's underneath it. If it's, if it's kind of set up in this format, it's really easy to create. All you got to do is go to your ribbon, click Insert, Table, and that's it. Enjoy your modern Excel table. You're ready to dive into all these amazing features in just a couple of clicks. All right, so that's the second method. The third method, let's say you don't have that tabular data set, and all you have to work with is something that is kind of unstructured. And by unstructured, I mean something like this. Layout number one here on the left shows something that might be nice for a report or a presentation that you're going to print and turn into your boss. Uh, but really, as far as analytics go, there's not much you can do with this in terms of uh, flexibility. It's just not there. You can't really sort it very easily. Um, you can't filter it. You can't pivot it. It's going to require a lot of massaging and reshaping of the data to get it into this tabular format here that Excel um, just works so well with. So to get from point A to point B here, your best friend is going to be something called Power Query. And we have a very short amount of time today, so we're not going to really get into the magic of Power Query. However, our friend Oz Du Soleil is coming up right after my session here, and he is going to walk you through some of the amazing things you can do with Power Query in terms of taking an unstructured data set and transforming it into that tabular format. Okay, so just to recap, here are the three methods for creating an Excel table. Best way to do it, import it right from a database. Secondly, you can convert a regular Excel range as long as it's in that kind of tabular setup that we looked at a moment ago. And last but not least, if it's not in a neatly shaped table, you can transform that with Power Query. All right. So let's say you've created your table and uh, you're ready to dive in. Here's some of the first things you're going to notice. The first thing, because we are visual creatures, right, you're going to notice this lovely formatting. The default format is usually a, kind of a blue, light blue, alternate row shading. And beyond the aesthetic appeal, it's um, this is also a great data entry aid. If, if you think about it, if you are you or someone on your staff is manually uh, doing some data entry, let's say, and you know, around about row 1500, your eyes are going to get pretty tired and that alternate row shading is helpful in terms of the data entry. Um, 
you can change the formatting very easily just by accessing the table styles uh, section of the table tools ribbon tab, which pops up whenever you're inside your table. It's one of those contextual tabs. So if I'm in the table, I'm going to have access to this table tools ribbon tab. If I'm outside the table, it goes away. You see that theme recurring a lot with Excel and it's no different with tables. All right, so the second thing you're probably going to notice right away is you've got these handy dandy little drop down arrows along the top row of your table. Uh, those are auto filter. Now, it's, auto filter is certainly available for regular ranges as well, but there's a few uh, key benefits when you use them in conjunction with these kinds of modern Excel tables. Um, but just to kind of refresh your memory, the auto filter is a great way to kind of isolate certain records. So let's say I want to I don't know, I want to look at uh, all managers whose names begin with M. I can create a text filter. I can search uh, by specific terms. I can also sort ascending or descending. So auto filter is a very powerful way to kind of isolate certain records. When you've isolated those records, the other ones get uh, temporarily hidden. So you can kind of zoom in on the data that you want to analyze. The other thing that you may notice, particularly if you have a really big table, this comes in um, handy, is as you scroll through your data set, and you're scrolling and you're scrolling, and row one kind of falls out of the uh, visible window, those column headers, as you recall from your very first Excel spreadsheet you probably ever created, those column headers are no longer A, B, C, D, E, right? They are now basically the names of those fields. So you don't have to wonder what column you're in. You can always just kind of glance up. Uh, for those of you who are already familiar with freeze panes in Excel, um, this is automatic with tables. So you don't have to actually do the freeze panes thing. It is automatic. Yet another little time saver that these modern Excel tables afford us. All right, I mentioned the uh, contextual ribbon. So when I'm inside the table, I'm going to have access to this table tools ribbon. Uh, some of the things we'll be working with today, changing the table name. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when you create a table for the first time in a workbook, the default name that Microsoft Excel assigns is going to be something really, you know, something really clever like table one, table two. Um, you don't have to accept those default names, particularly if you have more than one table in your workbook model, it's probably a good idea to give them a descriptive name. And um, we'll see why um, that is later on when we get to formulas. Uh, also, we, we looked at the um, modifying table colors and themes. So this is a great choice if you have, let's say, um, specific company branding, specific colors that you want to um, incorporate in your reporting, uh, you can browse there's quite a selection here already, but you can also modify any one of these uh, just by right-clicking on one of these and modifying the colors, the fonts, um, and the basic styles. Uh, we also have some table style options, including something really ha helpful called the total row. So we're going to look at the total row. The total row is basically a way to have subtotals, automatic formulas. You don't have to construct any formulas. It's choose from a drop-down list. So you put a check mark there, and your table suddenly has a total row. And last but not least, we're going to look at slicers. Uh, slicers are kind of a visual, a more visual, I like to say dashboard friendly, if you will, version of those auto filters. And um, they're really cool. I like them, and I think you're going to love them too. All right, so before we get into the advanced stuff, let's get our arms around some basic techniques that you're going to need to start working with these modern Excel tables. Okay, so let's say I need to add a new field to my table, uh, and I'm maintaining this table manually. The first thing you want to do is you simply, uh, you go to the right of the table, the first available blank column, I should say, at the right edge of your table, for example, um, you type the word variance, you tap the enter key, and the next thing you know, it just expands automatically, and you'll see the formatting expand uh, as, you, as you hit enter on that column. Uh, it is the same kind of concept for adding new rows uh, or records. If you have to do this manually, you simply find the first available blank row at the bottom of your table and just start typing away and you'll notice that formatting automatically expands to the bottom of your table. So um, the other way to do it, and this is true of many things in Excel, is a right-click menu. So you can also just click right, excuse me, you can right-click on any cell in the table and you can choose insert 
and insert table call. So there's lots of ways um, that you can add new information to your, your table. Of course, the ideal way to add new information, as with anything in Excel, we all love to automate, right? So uh, the automated method of adding new information would be if you had it connected to an external data source. Recall we talked about um, external connections earlier. So if you have, let's say, an external connection, uh, you'll know it right away because you right-click on your table, you have access to this refresh button. So when I right-click and I choose refresh, that will automatically sync my Excel table with that external data source. Uh, one little caveat is that any manual modifications you might have made in between refresh to your table uh, will most likely be overwritten. Uh, so when you sync with the database and there's a conflict between what you have in your table and what is in the database, the database wins. Okay, more basic techniques before we dive into some live examples. Um, adding a subtotal row. So once again, every, pretty much everything you're ever going to need is either going to be at your right click or in the table tools ribbon. So if you click, if you're inside your table and you click that table tools ribbon tab, you check the total row box, make sure that that box is checked. Then you simply choose your favorite function in your new total row. The behavior is as soon as I add a total row, you get this word total in the leftmost column of the table at the bottom row. And then on the right hand corner here, you'll notice there's a drop down. And that drop down gives you access to any kind of function you want. So for example, this is uh, giving me the sum of all revenue. And I didn't have to construct a formula there. That's just a drop down choice. So that's another time saver. You don't have to actually type equal sum, cell range, et cetera, et cetera. It's automatic. Okay, um, some basic table techniques for selecting table parts. Um, the hover point click method. This one's a little tricky, so I'm going to just switch over to Excel really quick and show you how this is done. You can certainly try this on your own once we have um, that file loaded on the website. All right, so um, here's an example. We haven't created a table yet. Um, but I'm going to go, notice I'm, I'm just in a random cell here in my tabular data set. I'm going to say insert table. And immediately I get a dialog that says, where's the data for your table? And look how smart Excel is. It knows where the upper left corner and the lower right corner are. It automatically detects that contiguous range. Yes, my table has headers. OK. So again, the default is usually this blue, lighter blue, but we can hover over our table tools. Uh, styles section and change that to another format if we like. So we'll go with the screen. So selecting table parts, um, the hover point click method, let's say I want to select uh, all of the uh, revenue numbers. Um, it's a really subtle mouse movement, so uh, if this doesn't work for you, I'm going to show you a second method. But if I just kind of hover over that word right there, revenue, and you'll notice I get this little downward pointing arrow, this little black arrow, and it's kind of like right on the border of that E where the gray stops and the green starts. And then I click, I left click once and it selects all the data in that column. If I left click again, it selects the header as well. And it's a little bit of a tricky move. You have to practice it because you have to be exactly in the right place. Um, here, for example, I'm going to select a row. So I'm just hovering um, right here on the edge of that row number five, and I'm going to just do a left click, twink, and it selects the whole row. Um, and now if that proves to be um, difficult, sometimes your mouse is overly sensitive or not sensitive enough, you can always right click, select table column data, right click, select uh, entire table column. So you see the difference there. All right, so that's just basically selecting uh, table parts. Okay. All right, now back to our uh, presentation here. We showed you how to do the right click. And so now we're ready to go into some more analysis. We're going to look at ways to sort and filter using these modern Excel tables. All right, uh, sorting table data dates. Um, if you have a table, and one of those columns has dates. Assuming you have correctly formatted dates, uh, you're going to know right away because when you click that little filter arrow, 
um, any column that has whatever it is, order date, um, accounting period, all kinds of uh, things that you can imagine, you'll notice it says sort oldest to newest or newest to oldest. And you can also kind of select individual years and months. Excel is very smart about dates and grouping them together. Um, so let's see a quick example of how we can use the sorting feature that is built into our tables. So I'm going to switch back over to the, to the complementary practice file that you will be receiving after this session. And I'm going to use data set 2 here, create a quick table just to show, just to prove to you how quickly you can do it. And here we go. So uh, order date. I click that arrow. I can sort oldest to newest or newest to oldest. And the dates, because I have them all formatted as dates, uh, are grouped by year and month. So I can really zoom in on a specific, let's say I want to look at um, on select. I just want to look at the first three months of 2016. And then it hides all the rest of them that I'm not interested in. I can see that the filter is on because I've got these blue row numbers at any time I can clear a filter. I can also sort, um, I can also sort not just dates, but really any kind of um, numeric or text fields. So numeric fields are going to have a similar thing. They're going to have smallest to largest or largest to smallest. Um, text fields A to Z or Z to A. Uh, so there's really a lot of uh, different ways you can uh, sort these tables. All right. Um, in addition to sorting, uh, I showed you, I gave you a little sneak preview of what it looks like when we filter for certain records. So um, when we do that, I also want to show you what happens to our subtotals. Uh, we talked about this total row, which I'm going to check here. And uh, now I've got a total in the lower right hand corner of my table. Now the wonderful thing about that, that total is it's not your familiar sum function, right? It's something maybe that looks weird if you haven't used tables before called subtotal. All that means is, first of all, it means I didn't have to construct it. I used my dropdown to select sum. Um, but what it means is if I modify the filters, for example, I want to see what the south and west region look like together, then that subtotal changes because it reflects, it, the calculation only takes into account the visible records. Right, and I can see there's a bunch of uh, records that are hidden here. Those are not included in my calculation. So that is a lovely time-saving feature. You don't have to resort your table and do your own subtotals. Just use the filters and use the subtotals in conjunction with those filters. Okay, uh, slicers, uh, what I like to refer to as AutoFilter's dashboard-friendly modern cousin are another way to kind of do the same, have the same effect, but in a much more visual um, kind of interactive way. So when I'm in my table and I come up here, and by the way, I think slicers and tables are only uh, with Excel 2010 and higher. So if there's anyone here who is using an earlier version, although I can't imagine why, um, slicers only work with tables starting in 2010, I believe. All right, so in my ribbon, my uh, table tools ribbon, insert slicer, and I'm going to choose, uh, let's say, uh, item. I want an item slicer. So just the same way I can filter by a particular item by hovering over, over here and choosing the item I'm interested in, I can also use these more visual interactive slicers. And let's say I only want candy. So then it's going to hide everything that is not candy. And again, my, my subtotals will, will update. And I'm going to add another one here because I can. Also, it doesn't really make sense to do a sum on unit cost. But we'll just leave that here for now. All right. Um, if I want to select more than one item, let's say I am interested in how my candy sales and my shoe sales are performing. I clicked on candy. I hold my control key. And then I also click on shoes. And now you can see. It's only those two items. And you can have more than one slicer if you like. I could add one for region and rep, and maybe if we have time later, we'll, we'll play around with some of that. Um, and you can start to see this is more like an interactive dashboard, right? I didn't have to create any weird formulas. It's all just point and click. Easy peasy, right? Cool. Now it's time to talk about the all new formula syntax, okay? So there's an all new formula syntax when it comes to these modern Excel tables. And those of you who haven't used them, it's going to be uh, new. So um, this is where you pay attention. 
<laughs> okay, the new formula syntax, also known as structured referencing. Um, it is called structured referencing because well, it's more structured. I think it's more intuitive. I feel like if this is the way I learned Excel in the first place to do Excel, I, I might find the kind of A1 style referencing much more confusing. Um, but here's, here's the deal. You create a formula in a t inside of a table, and uh, if I wanted to create a formula to, to subtract my target number from my revenue number to see how I'm performing, um, Normally, when I do this in Excel, I would expect to see, you know, I start typing equals, and then I would expect to see equals E2 minus D2, but nay, you don't see any uh, cell references here. Instead, you see these brackets, you see the column names, and you see this at symbol. So really, uh, a, an easy way to think about this is the bracket is around the name of the column, and if you see the little at symbol, that just means current row. Okay, so behind the scenes it's the same answer as if I had said equals E2 minus D2, but it's just in this new kind of syntax. So I'm going to pop over here to Excel and uh, let's see how that looks live. So I created my variance column just by typing variance, hitting enter, and then I'm going to say equals point and click to my revenue and instead of seeing E2, notice it comes up as equals at revenue, current row revenue minus current row target. And also when I hit enter, it just automatically populates all the way down. And that is another thing that is inherent in tables, this sort of automatic fill down effect. So notice I didn't have to click and drag and, and co or copy paste this down to 500 other rows, it did it for me automatically. It is the default behavior with tables um, and there are ways you, if you, sometimes you can accidentally turn it off but there are settings uh, that you can adjust in Excel to make sure that your tables automatically fill your formulas down. So I'm going to pop over to Excel one more time here and uh, show you that if we inspect these formulas, as I go down the rows, it is verbatim the exact same formula all the way down. Um, so that's this, the concept of structured referencing. Important to remember that at symbol means current row. Okay. Um, okay, so taking a step back and kind of comparing the structured referencing versus the A1 style formulas. Um, here's an, another example, which we'll do live in a moment. We've got a table with sales person, region, sale amount, uh, percent commission, and commission amount. And we've created a table out of that. We've also renamed our table to department sales. Now, if I wanted to get the total sale amount, and let's say I did this before I ever created an Excel table, this is a syntax that most of you are familiar with. This is the what I'm calling the A1 style, um, equals sum. C2 colon C7, right? And that is going to get me this result, 3,970. The structured referencing equivalent looks like this. Equal sum, and here's the, the name of the table. Now, I'll, we'll get into why we have to put the table name in there in a moment. Um, and then here's the reference to the column, sales amount. See, column name, column name. So let's take a look at how that how that works. Popping back over to Excel, over to my sales commission table, and I'm going to say insert table. Yes, my table has headers, and there we go. We'll leave this, we'll leave this blue. And here's the uh, formula that I already created, uh, C2 colon C7. Now, if I try to create this formula one more time using the structured referencing method, um, one thing I want you to notice right away is I'm creating this formula outside of my table range because I'm not inside, here I'm inside the table, here I'm outside. Because I'm creating the formula outside the table range, I have to use the table qualifier. Uh, and the table qualifier is going to be whatever the table name is. Currently, it's called table four. But I'm going to rename that to department DPT sales, right? So now I can refer to this table anywhere in my workbook as DEPT sales. And I can say sum D E P 
And as soon as I type that much, notice this little pop-up here. Excel is expecting me to um, say, hey, I think you want to say department sales, don't you? Why, yes, I do, Excel. Thank you. I'm just going to hit tab to let Excel autocomplete that for me. So now I can see right away that it's referring to the table, blue letters, blue lines. So far, so good. Now, how do I get a list of the potential columns here? Oh, how about an open bracket? Seems like a good guess, right? Well, there you go. So um, when I type that open bracket, again, it sort of prompts Excel to pull up a list of things that I might want to choose from. And I can double click that sales amount, close the bracket. And when I finish my formula, it is the same result as the A1 style. I get the exact same answers here. Okay. Okay, so the important thing, uh, to, the important takeaway there is that whenever you are creating formulas outside of your table, you need to use a table qualifier, which is simply the name of the table. Okay? All right, we're going to get into some advanced formula techniques now. And why are they advanced? Well, this is where we get into absolute and relative referencing. Now, uh, for people who use Excel every day, this is perhaps not the most advanced concept in the world, but it can be tricky, and it's especially tricky when you are trying to rewire your brain to start doing this structured referencing style instead of the A1 style that we're so used to, right? So um, my, one of my favorite ways to kind of uh, illustrate the dollar sign placement and why it's so important is multiplication table. So we create this little multiplication table in Excel, going all the way back to the fourth grade here, people. Um, here are the formulas behind it, right? So let's, let's just, for, for fun, we're going to just do this live. All right, so if I have numbers uh, 1 through 10 on the left here, I can click and drag there, and then I can copy a special transpose to get the same numbers up top and I'll just make these bold so they're a little it's a little easier to read our matrix right so I'm going to zoom in here um, let's say I want to create this multiplication table and uh, such that this is let's say it doesn't really matter whether I choose a1 or or B1 or A2 first. It doesn't really matter. Whether it's B1 times A2 or A2 times B1, I'm going to get the same result. Hooray! But absent of any dollar signs, things get a little weird when I try to copy that formula down, right? So I have to think about how can I create a formula that's going to allow me to copy, paste, or click and drag all the way from here to the outer edge of my matrix and get the correct answer. As anyone who uses Excel regularly knows, it's all about the dollar signs. So where are we going to put the dollar signs? Here are the two uh, factors of our equation, right? That's what they call it in multiplication, right? Or is it the multiplier and the, the multiplicand something? Um, I don't know. The factors works for me. Uh, so I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of that A, and I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of that 1. Why? Because think about it, when I drag this formula across, I want this result to be here, I want this to be 2 times 1. This result here, I want it to be 3 times 1, and 6 times 1, and so on. I keep referring back to column A, so column A has to be the part that is fixed. When I copy down, I want that row 1 to stay fixed. Why? Because here, I'm going to want this to be 1 times 2. Here, I'm going to want this to be 1 times 3. Here I'm going to want this to be one times so on. So that one needs to stay fixed. So those are basically the two pieces that we want to stay absolute. And when I click and drag across, I get the correct answer. And that is why the dollar signs are so important, right? Okay, let me just get the next slide up here. So the dollars, the point is the dollar sign placement is key for accurate results in regular Excel. It is also key for accurate results when it comes to structured referencing. But this is very tricky because it is not immediately obvious. You can't just cram a dollar sign onto one of those uh, bracketed references. It takes a, a bit of um, 
bit of handiwork. So let's talk about that. We're going to work with a table um, here in our practice file where you've got uh, cat names, category of spending, and the amount we've spent in each period. Okay, so we've got this table here, and we're going to pop over there in a second. Um, but the, the object of the exercise here is we've got these cats, we've got the categories, and we've got the spending amounts. We want to create a little summary below our data table that is going to summarize the amount that we spent on each cat in each period, right? So let's, let's see how we would do that with regular Excel. And then let's compare what that looks like with structured referencing. Now I am uh, back in, in, the, uh, in the handout file here, and I've already created this table in advance, like on the cooking shows. Um, we've already done our insert table, and then we renamed it cat spend. Okay, so I'm going to just cheat a little bit here, and I'm going to do a structured, excuse me, I'm going to do A1 style first, uh, so you can see the difference when we do structured referencing later on. So, here goes. If I want to know how much we spent in period one on, well, Mr. Fluffy Pants, I'm going to say equals sum. I'm sorry, I'm going to say equals sum ifs, right? This is a conditional summing. Uh, the first argument of sum ifs is my sum range, and in this particular cell, I want the P1 spend. So I'm just going to say uh, C2. I'm going to say C. I'm going to put a dollar to fix that too through C, 13. So do a tally on those numbers wherever the cat name. So I'm going to lock this one down all the way, A2 through A13. Fully absolute reference there. Wherever that range contains this name. And I'm going to lock that down as well. So that, if I did it with Good old-fashioned A1 style will get me the correct answer. How do I know that? Well, I, um, I'm pretty confident in my Excel skills for number one. <laughs> but how do you know that? Well, you can actually highlight all these numbers and look down. Um, hopefully you can see it on your screen. On your status bar, sum of selected cells, 22,386. Let's compare that up here, 22,386. So I, I clearly got the right answer. But again, this is... Um, this is A1 style. The important thing there is you get your dollar signs correct in the very first formula, so you can copy and paste it across. Um, not so easy with the structured referencing, right? Structured referencing things get a little trickier. And keep in mind, you cannot mix the dollar signs with structured referencing style column or row references. So how are we going to get around that? Let's check it out right now. Okay, so back in our cat spend table, I'm just going to erase these formulas here, and we're going to start over using good old-fashioned structured referencing, and I'm going to show you how to get those fixed references. Here, this A2, notice this has to be totally fixed, both the row and the column. We're going to see how to do that with structured referencing. So let's clear these out and start over. So P1 spent, I'm going to do the same sum ifs, and I'm going to use my little point and click method there that I showed you earlier. That selects all of the table data. So that's my sum range. The criteria range, so we're saying do a tally on that sum range wherever the cat name equals this guy here. Now notice a couple of things. Um, this A19 is not a structured reference because it's outside of the table. So any form, formula arguments that refer to my table are going to be in the structured referencing style. But if I also have formula arguments that are outside the table, I need to just use the, I, I have no choice. I have to use regular A1 style. So you can do this mixed, mixed thing. So let's see if this works. Does anyone want to place a bet? No. Ah, something went terribly awry. Look, look what happens when I copy across. It becomes zero. Why on earth did it become zero? Because that first, uh, that second argument rather, the, the red boxes, which, is, which are supposed to stay fixed. When I copied it over, it moved into the, the category column. When I copied it over here, it moved into P1 spend. So it just became a nonsensical formula from, from, from here on out. So something 
uh, is missing here, and we're going to dissect this right now. Uh, actually, we're not going to do a whole lot of dissecting. I'm just going to tell you because it's this really weird, obscure trick that I learned on ExcelCampus.com, um, how to create a fixed column reference. Okay, so this is the this is the component of the formula that we need to kind of lock down. So I'm going to just type over it, recreate it. And what you do here is you kind of create this uh, almost like a duplicate column reference uh, as if I were going to select two columns. And notice what, it, what we've got here. We've got cat spend, and then we've got this double bracketed thing, and it goes from cat name to category. We just want to change the second one there. So it's cat name, cat name. So it's basically you're just duplicating the column reference with a colon, almost like the A1 style, uh, but just a little bit, little bit different take some getting used to. So that is basically how we create a fixed column reference. Now, if I copy this across and copy that down, do my check, 22,386, 22,386, yay. Okay, that's fantastic. So um, that is how to create a structured, uh, a, a, sorry, an absolute reference in a structured referencing formula. Okay, so we walked through this bit. Um, I should also call your attention to the fact that uh, copy-paste is also problematic with the structured referencing if you don't have those fixed uh, references set up correctly. So for example, um, before we were just doing click and drag, now if I had tried copy-paste instead, unfortunately this would be the result. So if I even if I got my formula correct in the very first one, the minute I copy paste across, it literally just puts the exact same formula verbatim all the way across, which is why we have 907s all the way across. So you can't just get around this with copy paste. You have got to use this weird technique that I just showed you. I don't know, maybe Microsoft will fix it so they put the dollar signs in there. Are you listening? Because that would be really <laughs> that would be a lot easier, especially for those of us who are used to doing the dollar sign method. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm just going to fly through these slides here because we, we demoed that live, and I believe you will have access to both the handout, uh, the, the um, PowerPoint, as well as the Excel file after the session. So, uh, so I just want to recap some of the benefits of a dynamic range. So we've seen how uh, tables will automatically expand as we use as we enter new information, whether we're adding new fields, new rows, whatever, um, and as that table is automatically expanding, the underlying data source is automatically expanding when it comes to things like charts and uh, pivot tables. So the really cool thing is that you can, for example, I could add a column to this table here, uh, let's say May 17, and because this chart is based on this table, as soon as I type that new column, we're going to see the chart kind of just make room for May. So you don't have to make any adjustments to, for example, the, uh, the chart source data. Uh, for those of you who have been using Excel for a while and are into charting, you might have heard of using um, offset or these crazy techniques to, to get those ranges to be dynamic. But you don't need to do that with tables. So let's see what that looks like live. Switching back over to Excel. I'm just so hooked on it. I can't stop. You can't stop me. All right. Um, so we're in data set five, chart source. I'm going to say insert table, create table. Yes, that is the data for my table, and my, da my table does have headers. Um, so now I'm going to just come over here to a random place, and I'm going to say let's insert a chart. And right now I haven't told the chart where the data is coming from or anything like that. So I need to um, right-click on that chart and say, hey, this is where the data is coming from. Then I get a dialog that says, okay, show me the chart data range. And I say, okay, how about I just hover over here in the upper left-hand corner so that my little arrow is pointing this way, diagonally facing down. And I click on that twice. And as I click on that twice, notice the chart data range. Now, I haven't renamed this table. Um, I just accept the default of table 5, but you could rename it if you like, uh, and it would update in all your formulas, by the way. Um, table 5 and that hashtag all simply means it's referring to the whole table. 
and I click OK, and I see that it gives me this default format. And now, just like with tables, when I'm in a chart, I get access to a table, or sorry, a, a contextual ribbon specific to the chart. And if, for instance, I want to see the dates going across the bottom, I might want to choose a switch row column. Um, so, so far, so good, and hopefully this is going to work. Uh, if I come over here and type a new column, May 17, let's say, my chart automatically has expanded to make room for May. So as soon as I start entering numbers there, I'm just going to make some numbers up. It automatically updates along with the chart here. So uh, if I have a new region, as soon as I type that, type some numbers there, now I've got some, uh, now I've got an additional series in my chart. Um, and we don't see what those are because we have not told the chart to add a series. So we're going to say add chart element and we'll create a legend at the right. So you can see it made room for my new month. It made room for my new region. Uh, and if I take those uh, components away, delete table columns, delete uh, maybe central went out of business, delete table rows, uh, it's all very dynamic. And that's because of the dynamic nature of the table range. No more offset craziness. Okay, so um, we looked at how charts will update automatically. Dynamic nature of Excel tables um, allow for increased productivity, not just with charts, but really for all kinds of things that we do in Excel. So whether that is um, pivot tables or VLOOKUP or some ifs even, anything that any formula or pivot table that you use that relies on a data range in Excel, if you can make it work with a table, you will never have to worry about uh, stuff falling out of range of, of, your, of your chart, your pivot table, and your list, etc. So some things are just better together. All right, um, allowing you to make beautiful uh, dashboards like this. So we're going to do a quick uh, five-minute dashboard here, and uh, you'll see how tables can be used to um, kind of bring all these things together. Okay, so switching back over to our Excel file for our final demo. And we're going to go over to our units sold data set. Okay, so we already kind of started this. And I'm just going to show you all of the wonderful things that you can do to make a quick dashboard based on a table. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move my slicers over here. I can insert the column, and I'm going to move my slicers over here to column A so that uh, they're kind of in a nice, neat place here to the left of my table. Um, I can clear the filters at any time. And, um, I'm going to add a couple more slicers here. So in addition to item, maybe I want to see rep, and maybe I also want to see region. Okay, so I'm just going to add those two. Um, and just like tables, these slicers can be formatted in different colors, and we'll show you how that looks in a moment. I'm just going to align these so that they um, are all kind of the same size. It's just a, a nice aesthetic touch there. So uh, I could be using, I could be doing this a better way, but it's just like aligning shapes or text boxes in PowerPoint. Uh, if I want to make these different colors, just for yucks, we can do that, make that one that color. Uh, maybe we can make this one uh, yellow. There you go. Uh, and I can also remove grid lines from my worksheet, start to make it look a little less busy. Uh, and I can also, if I wanted to add, let's say I want to add maybe some conditional formatting to the charts, maybe I want to get um, some bar charts here on my units column. Um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to remove the, the alternate row shading because I'm going to, I'm going to just do my own kind of formatting. And so there is an option uh, on the table tools uh, design tab here where you can basically just choose no, no formatting at all. Uh, so it doesn't look like a table until you start playing around with it. And the reason I did that is because we're going to do a little conditional formatting thing here on our units. So if I do a right-click select 
uh, table column data that selects all the data in that column and I can come over here to my conditional formatting menu in my home tab and I'm gonna say okay how about some uh, how about some data bars and if you don't like any of these colors you can go into um, manage rules edit rule and maybe we want a, a color that's a little more subtle so we'll choose a lighter color see if we like that better a little better. Uh, okay, now how about some uh, how about some charts? If I uh, select the order date column, actually I'm going to remove the total row for a moment. I'm going to select the order date column, and I'm going to hold down my control key, and I'm also going to select my units column. And the way that I did that was just control shift down arrow for the first one, click over to the second column, control shift down arrow. So I'm multi-selecting these two columns and I'm going to insert a chart and as soon as I do insert line chart I get this lovely units chart I can resize that um, I can play around with the formatting so that the dates are a little cleaner looking uh, but for now one thing that I do want to point out is that if you start to use these filters at this point look what's happening to my chart it's getting it's getting kind of squashed right so what I want to do is um, set the property of this chart right click format chart area here we have size and properties uh, it's in properties we want to say don't move or size with cells that'll prevent that chart from kind of getting squashed if I choose the wrong item or whatever so notice that no matter what I choose with my filters um, that the chart kind of stays the same size and it doesn't disappear uh, so that is a kind of a quick five five minute dashboard as I promised and there's there's lots more you can do uh, you can also remove column headers you can minimize your ribbon and nobody even knows you're in Excel right uh, so that is getting close to the end of our session here um, those are some of the things I love about Excel tables the productivity the, the easier formatting um, the little time savers. When you use Excel 24-7, time savers are very important. So let's just kind of recap uh, what's to love about these modern Excel tables. My 10 favorite reason, connected data models with the database friendly importing and syncing just with a few clicks. Improved aesthetic appeal, we saw the, the instant formatting and styles gallery, lots of options so you don't have to mess around with uh, shading and, and fonts and things like that. Uh, easier on-the-fly analysis as you sort slice and dice with the auto filter or even the slicers the dashboard friendly visual interactive version of of, uh, of auto filter automatically expanding and contracting table boundaries absolutely the coolest thing ever because it also leads to easier maintenance for pivot tables charts and really anything anything that you've ever done in Excel that requires a changing data range is a whole lot easier with tables um, also particularly important when your tables are you know really large data set faster navigation um, selecting entire columns with just a, a couple of clicks you've got a table that's you know 55,000 rows tall one click you select the whole column awesome stuff reduced copy paste burden so just like with the selection uh, you don't have to keep clicking and dragging that formula all the way down you just put it in the top row hit enter boom it copies all the way down to the bottom of your table and of course the intuitive formulas now I suppose you could argue <laughs> that this is not your favorite thing about tables but um, but that's just because you're not used to it so the, the a1 style syntax uh, if that's what you were used to it's just a matter of rewiring your brain but once you get used to it I think it's it's really intuitive and great and I hope that you will agree um, and of course the quick one click access to all your favorite formulas with those subtotals so uh, with that uh, we're up towards the end of the session here and I just want to thank you and uh, remind you that this was a co-production between Excel TV and the past Excel BI virtual cap chapter. Um, and we hope to see you again in the future. I will take any questions. Uh, Johan, if there's any questions, feel free to uh, let me know now. Otherwise, yes, there um, are. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. bring it. Um, how do you know what is best source of or format for external data sources? 
how do we know what is the best format for external data sources? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure what, what, are you referring to what the best database is or what? I'm, I'm, sure I'm guessing, I'm guessing Kerry here is asking uh, how you know which source, best source to choose. I think that's really an Apple thing. Well, in, in a corporate environment, it's, it's going to be largely dependent on what, what sort of systems you have in place. Um, and, and oftentimes analysts don't have a whole lot of control over that. But um, if, you, if you are set and trying to kind of set up your own standalone data model, uh, one thing that I found uh, as an Excel analyst that is easy and uh, intuitive enough is to just use, for example, an access table. As a, as a back-end source. You don't have to know a whole lot about access programming or anything, but if you have a lot of data and your Excel model is starting to choke because there's just too much data being stored in it, put it in an access database. It's super easy to import that into Excel and you just, you just update the table in access. You can one-click refresh. Um, so that's a nice workaround if you don't have keys to the, the IT kingdom where they have all those external systems. Hopefully that's a, hopefully that is a good explanation. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Uh, other questions? I think, yes, we will take another question. Um, when creating data validation drop-down lists using table, do you define a name referencing mm -hmm. that table or just referencing yes. the range? Um, I typically find it's easier to create a defined name and then base that defined name on the table. So it's, it's pretty much the same way you would do it uh, normally. It's just the only difference is in, instead of selecting a uh, range as your source list, you select that column in the table and you, or you define a name from it. Mm -hmm. What about missing values, like importing to table computation? In uh, missing values from imported data? Yeah. Well, um, so if the values are missing and you've imported, then then I guess it's a um, you know an audit project to figure out why those values are missing. If you know they're missing for a reason and you want to supplement, uh, then we get into uh, a little bit more you know complicated creating a data model. So, for example, if you have in your external system, you know stuff is always going to be missing, and then you have to track that separately. Um, with data modeling, there is a way to bring those those two worlds together, but it's it's another it's another webinar. Yeah, uh, what's the best way to use you uh, use to combine tables that are of the same exact structure, headers and data types in each column, but are on separate worksheets in the same workbook? Stick around for the next session. Talk about Power Query. Um, that's what I would do if you have if you have separate tables. And you need to combine them and uh, into a unified source. You create a pivot table. Um, Power Query is a great tool for that. Uh, how to rearrange columns in the table? Oh, just just click and drag. Just uh, just uh, let's see. Ta-da! See that how I just took that item column? You just sort of hover until you see this double-headed arrow and you can move it to another location. Mm -hmm. um, does the slicer area expand if the combinations increase in number? Yes, the slicers will automatically expand if I add new, new values. Are there also disadvantages of new Excel tables in comparison with the data range? I can't think of one right now, but maybe uh... there is. <laughs> I, I would just say the learning curve, if it's something you haven't really um, explored before, getting used to that structured referencing is a little, um, is a little daunting at first. But, uh, and also the transferability, if other people in your organization aren't familiar with it, there's a training element, but you know, those are the things that you have to evaluate case by case. But I, I'm a fan of, of using them because, uh, just because I think that, because they play so nicely with databases, they're really kind of, they, they give you a leg up into things like a Power Query, Power Pivot, um, and those types of things. And we want to be looking towards the future and not, um, not the past. All right. I think we have to wrap it up there, folks. Um, some okay. people asked about a copy of the slides. I can, if Sylvia sent them to me, I can put them on yep, the web page as well. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, I will send you the slides. Yeah, and for people not uh, finding our uh, virtual uh, chapter channel on YouTube, go to xlbivc.sqlpass.org and there is a link there. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Um, please attend the, the next session as well, where uh, Oslo Sadai presents intro to data cleansing with Get and Transform, or as it's also known, Power Query. So, once again, thank you very much, Sylvia, and thank you everybody for uh, attending, and have a nice evening.